praise the Lord, church. Should we all stand, open with prayer? Father, we are so thankful for another opportunity to come into your house, to come into your gates with thanksgiving, to come into your courts with praise. You're such a good God, so merciful and kind. We ask, Lord, that you be with us this night, God. Be in the midst of this worship. Be in the midst of this service. Let your perfect will be accomplished. Touch and minister as you desire. Anoint and heal as you want. Let this be accomplished in your name, God. Let this be your service. We lift it up in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Lord bless you. You may be seated.
out to Jesus. He's your everything. We are going to go to him in prayer at this time. We want to continue to pray for Sister Denise Brainerd um, having some medical issues. I know she's got this problem in her foot trying to avoid surgery, but on top of that she has some other issues with her body. So pray for Sister Denise. We will pray for Colby, the brother of Sister Nikki. Um, God would work in that situation with that cancer. We have testimonies in this local congregation of what God can do with cancer. So let's lift Colby up tonight. Let's pray for uh, Sister Kayleen Etheridge. She was taken to the ER over the weekend. I've not heard an update on her, but let's pray for her. And let's lift up George Reynolds, the uncle of Sister Rachel. Um, issues with diabetes, and then we have to amputate his legs. So let's lift him up tonight. Can we go to him in prayer? And after we do our prayer, we'll be doing a prayer call special. But unspoken needs, let's go to the prayer for these unspoken and needs that have been spoken tonight. Father, we're asking, God, that you would move in an authoritative manner. God, these that are in serious illness, physical need of a healing touch. God, we know you're the great physician. You're the creator of the body. God, you know everything on how to effectuate a change. We ask your perfect will to be accomplished. Lord, we're asking God the healing virtue would go. Lord, I ask your anointing on every unspoken need represented in this house tonight. God, you know the burdens of your people. You know the heaviness of heart tonight. I pray, God, that you would be with them. I pray, God, that you would minister. I pray your authority into their lives and into their minds, into their circumstance tonight. Oh, Lord, we ask this tonight. Tonight, knowing you're on the throne, knowing all things are in your hands, knowing all things are in your power. God, we ask it in your authority. We ask it in your name. We ask it in you to do these things in your name, Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We are going to do a special prayer tonight. If some of the ladies and ministerial team could come. Sister Mary Neese is in need. touch pastor was went to pray for her and she specifically asked that in addition to that prayer if the church would bind together so pastor has asked if some of the ladies and the ministerial if you'll come so let's pray the prayer of faith sister niece has many testimonies of how god has moved in her life physically she's asking once again that god would honor her request so let's pray tonight father we're lifting up Sister Niece tonight. God, you know the physical affirmity, the affliction that's attacking her right now. Father, you know that her desire is to be in the house. You know her desire is to live for you in totality. But God, she's hampered tonight by a physical illness. God, she's in bondage tonight by the physical affirmity. And we're asking God that you would move into her body. Oh Lord, that you would anoint. Father, that you would encourage. Oh Lord, that your will would be done. God, that you would lift her up. Oh, Lord, that there would be another testimony of hers. God, that you would have another praise report. God, that she would return once again with the goodness of your mercy. Father, we're asking God the healing virtue. We're asking God strength of mind. We're asking God to move, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, anoint. Go and be with her. Father, touch. Oh, in your name. And we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, church. I believe in prayer. I believe in prayer. I've experienced too many things, seen too much for people to tell me otherwise. You may be seated. Got a couple announcements tonight. We've got a birthday coming up tomorrow. Brother Sean Sulfridge. Wave your, wave your hand there, bro. He wanted to, you know, his birthday is tomorrow. And he's not shy. He told me how old. He's going to be 54. So wish him a happy birthday on your way out. The other announcement is it's been. Uh, spoken over last weekend on Sunday night. We have Sunday morning service, normal, at 10, and then Sunday night at our PM service. We're going to have the missionaries from Spain here. 
So brother and uh, sister Paul will be with us Sunday evening. So you don't want to miss that. I've been in quite a few missionary services, and it's always a move of God. It's, it's exciting to see what God's doing, not just in this local, and he's moving here, but to see what he's doing around the world. So come Sunday night, prepare to be blessed and to bless them. If our ushers would come at this time, we're going to take up our offering. Our scripture comes from Deuteronomy 16, 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Give as you can give. That's all that God asks. Let's pray over this offering tonight. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to give back to you in appreciation and gratitude of what you've blessed us with. I ask a blessing upon this offering, upon those who are giving, anoint and touch. Be with them as they continue to be in your will and in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you.
that love, anything is bearable, anything is possible. somebody close to you and tell them you're glad to see them here this evening. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Well, amen. Presence of the Lord is in this place. You believe that tonight? I still believe that anything can happen. Anything, anything can happen when the presence of the Lord is in the house. Thank God. I also believe that wherever you go, the presence of the Lord is with you, right? So wherever you go, when you're in the presence of the Lord and you begin to pray or you're singing in your car or whatever, amen, the Lord is there to respond, amen, a lot of times in our own humanity we get in the way of that because of the cares of life and things that go on around us and uh, we fail to understand that, amen, God is, uh, God is there with us, amen. Well, can you believe it, it is, we are midway through March and uh, Easter is I believe the 9th of April. It's it's upon us. We're not that far away from Easter. And the recognition of what Christ did for us. Amen. <clears throat> he shed his blood for us. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, amen, that cleanses us from a multitude of sin. So tonight, 
Amen. I'm going to direct your attention to Gen the second chapter of the book of Genesis because we're going to be setting up and talking a little bit about this at least the next couple of weeks, if not beyond. But <clears throat> we want to, uh, amen, talk about, amen, the reason that there is a need for his blood. Because we cannot have the freedom we have tonight without that blood being applied to our lives. Yeah. In fact, if we did not have the blood, we wouldn't have hope. And it's only through the blood that we have the hope that we have. Because in our own humanity, in our sinful state, amen, we, we have no remedy. Uh, but he set forth a plan. Amen. That gives us the hope that we had today. So, amen. Let's let's read just uh, uh, here beginning in Genesis, the second chapter. I'm going to be reading verses 7 through 9, and then I'm going to go over to Genesis. We'll sit down, and then I'll, I'll read some more, uh, and we'll, get, uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, address some of the other things, other scriptures. Genesis 7 through 9, then 15 through 17. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the eye, to the sight, to the eyes, good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took man, verse 15, the Lord God took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. He gave him responsibility. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, if every tree of the garden you may eat freely, But of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall <clears throat> surely die. It's pretty plain. He didn't mince words. He was just out with it. Amen. And he was trying to instill something into Adam's head. I formed you. I created you. And we'll talk a little bit about our will. He gave us a will. He gave us the ability to choose. Amen. Lord God, we thank you once again for your presence that's in this place. You are here. This is hallowed ground. And I pray, God, for the next few moments that you would touch our hearts and minds as we delve into your word. <clears throat> let your word illuminate our lives. Amen. Let it, let, it, let it help us along the way. And let your word keep us. Let it guide us. Strengthen us. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray and everybody say amen. amen. God bless you. The blood of Jesus Christ. You know, God had specific reasons for creating the world. And uh, as you read the account of the creation, you know he created the heavens and he created the earth and <clears throat> everything therein. But we have to understand that the reason that he did it was to create a manifestation of his glory. So when you read the word, you know, the psalmist said in chapter 19, verse 1, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, all the elements of nature, the sun, the moon, the, the, the stars, the trees, the forest, the rain, the snow, all the rivers, the streams, the hills, the mountains, all the animals, all the fish in the sea, birds, all of that stuff, they shout out praise to God who made them. 
and more importantly, God created Adam and Eve, the Bible said in His own image, so that He could have a relationship, one that was loving, a personal relationship. There's, there's nothing greater <clears throat> in our personal lives than personal relationships. But the intention was that He was going to create them for all eternity. All eternity. Everybody say all eternity. So He created them. And God designed humans or humankind with what? He gave them a body. He gave them a soul. And He gave them a spirit. In other words, possessing mind, emotion, and will. And He did all that so they could respond to Him freely as God, or as we would say, the Lord of their lives. And they would worship Him out of faith, loyalty, and gratitude. Faith, loyalty, and gratitude. Think about that for a moment. I think that fits what we do when we come to the house of God. Number one, faith. Everybody say faith. Turn to your neighbor and say faith. Being loyal to the things of God and having a heart of thanksgiving or gratitude for what God has done in our lives. So mankind was created for the purpose of having an intimate relationship with God. That was why it was there. We read the story. He came down to cool the evening. He talked with them. He communed with them. There was relationship. <clears throat> relationship, really, a good relationship, we all know, hinges on communication. How do we communicate? Amen. And so, Genesis 2.15 tells us that the Lord took man, and he, he created man, and put him, placed him in the Garden of Eden to be the husbandman, the, the dresser of it. <clears throat> and so the life in the Garden of Eden was was actually being there, it was the life, your life, his life was complete, it was painless, it was peaceful, everything was great, everything as we would say was hunky-dory, everything was just uh, uh, pristine, everything was, was wonderful and, 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 and you, you, you were in that place that God created and then God created you to take care of the place. So what happened? What happened? What transpired? When you look at Genesis the cha chapter 3, you'll find out exactly what happened. Verses 1 through 11, if you'll follow with me. <clears throat> Notice what it says. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent said to her, you will not surely die. Isn't that, isn't that what the devil always tells us? Eh, you can play with it. Eh, you can touch it. Eh, it's pretty appealing to the eye. Right? He still uses the same tactics today in temptation. And then he goes on to talk to her. And he says, for God knows that in the day you eat, eat it, your eyes will be open. And you'll be like God. Knowing good and evil. That's pretty appealing. That's puffed up, you know. I mean, oh boy, talk about an ego, an, an, an ego massage right there. He was working on her like, ah, you, you're not going to die. It's just your, 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 your mind's going to be opened and you're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
<clears throat> and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. Now, the, 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 the crazy thing here is that the scripture says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, you see, the serpent came and deceived her and said, oh, it's good, it's okay. And to that point, all of a sudden, she looks at it and sees that it's good for food. And it was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And the Bible said she also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings. Verse 8 says, and then, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? He knew where they were at. Communication. So Adam, so Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, 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 who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not? Now, the question I have right now is why did God put the tree in the Garden of Eden? Why did he place that temptation there? Number one, freedom of choice. Now you hear that phrase a lot in today's world. Freedom of choice. God gave man the ability to have his own free will or the ability to choose. It's like, you know, uh, Joshua, choose you this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. A choice had to be made. All through the Word of God, decisions were being made. Choices were being made, either for the right or the wrong. Either to be blessed or to be cursed. Freedom. Because true love is only true love when you choose to love someone. Right? When you marry somebody, you marry them because you love them. But it can't be just a word that you say. It's got to be something that comes from your heart. It's easy to say, I love you. And sometimes we say that in response to an I love you. You'll just kind of say it back tongue in cheek. But love is more than just a word. It's a feeling. It's a desire. I choose to love. I choose to marry you. I choose to have this. So <clears throat> this is the reason why God planted the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. Because he wanted Adam to have the choice to obey him or disobey him, folks. The temptation of the world, that tree in a sense is still around us. It's still there. You still walk by it every now and then. You still observe it. You still see it. I like to think that, 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 that when the serpent came to her and then she said, oh, and she saw it and look, oh, the fruit looks good and it's pleasing to the eye and all that kind of stuff. I kind of like to think because of the Alarm, the warning that, that Adam told her before, we don't touch that. We don't go around that. We don't partake of that. We don't eat that. That they just, want, they just knew that that was off limits. You and I, we got to realize that today in our day and time, there are things out there that might be pleasant to the eye or it might be something that you think might be uh, good for, for you or you would like to partake in that. But yet, the same warning goes forth and says, if you touch it, if you eat of it, you will die. No, maybe not physically, but spiritually. Spiritually. 
we have to pay attention to that. Because God wanted somebody that chose to obey him, chose to love him. And then in this situation, they chose to disobey his word. It's a choice. Everybody say a choice. Hey Amen. You know what? That's why, you know, you hear people say it every now and then, but that's why God didn't create robots or machines. <clears throat> because they don't have the ability or the capability or love it, of loving or feeling. Because if that was the case, he would have just created us that way. So, number one, it was important that God placed Adam and Eve there and gave them the freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. Number two, the serpent, I believe, was jealous. How about I say jealous? You know, do you know the devil's jealous of you? Do you know he's jealous of you right now because of what we felt here before? Remember, he used to be in the presence of God. Remember, he was here in the hallelujahs and, and the accolades and the, and the glory and, and, and feeling the, the awesomeness and the power of God. He understood what that was. Now, you and I, we don't just feel it out here, but he lives in us. Amen. So, when you read the story, the serpent was jealous of the freedom that God had given to Adam and Eve. You know, the Bible tells us, and let's just know plainly that Satan is a liar and he is the father of all lies. There's too many church people today getting caught up in allowing him to lie to them and to give them falsehoods, amen, Unders not, not really catching on that, that, that this guy is cunning. He is, he is absolutely good at what he does and he can appear as an angel of light and the light bulbs go on and you think, oh man, this is great, this is hunky-dory, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. But when you go for it, all of a sudden you're left wanting. We get distracted. The enemy is jealous. And he tried to make Eve feel underprivileged. Can I put it this way? Sometimes the enemy will come and want to try to make us feel unwanted, unloved, unappreciated. He'll come to us with all these little things to get our minds spinning on, on uh, woe is me, poor me, right? Pity me, you know? All these kind of things like that. How many has ever been there before? Have you ever had self-pity before? Has anybody had self-pity where you're just saying, man... Man, you know, whatever, you get all down and out and into mully grubs, as they would say, and you just kind of feel like, you know, what's the use? Uh, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, you know, the pastor don't love me. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, you know, pastor's wife, first lady, she uh, didn't speak to me tonight. And, and uh, you know. You know, it's the way it is. We can get offended at a lot of things. And usually a lot of times there's nothing there, but that enemy will start barking in our ear. He'll start barking in our ear. You're underappreciated. You're not loved. You know, if they won't take the time to, to, you know, whatever. My wife tells me all the time, you need to wear your hearing aids. Because she says sometimes people are calling you, call, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, and you just walk on. I'm like, well... Just get a hold of me. Stop me. <clears throat> Poke me on the shoulder. But, but, but jealousy, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like your relationship with God. He doesn't like the fact that we can sing, raise our hands, and, and raise our voice, and, and the power of God, and the, the glory of God, and is manifest in our... He doesn't like that. He's jealous of that. So I, I'm here to tell you tonight that if you come to church feeling down and out, raise your hands and start thanking God and singing the songs of Zion. Amen. Because it'll, it'll chase that away. He's jealous of us. So he tried to work on Eve. God don't love you. Eve, if God really loved you, he would have made you first.
just saying. He really loves you. He really loves you. The whole point was he was trying to get her to focus on what she couldn't have. Now, let me focus on that for a moment. There's too many of us sitting on church pews today that are being wooed in by what we, in our mind, what we can't have. Let me break it down simple. I, I was here today, went downstairs. They was getting down here. I walked in, had my cup of coffee. I looked on the table over there, and I seen two big boxes, Brother Howard, of donuts. Now, my mind said, you can't have that. But my flesh said, yes, I can. Now, full disclosure, I didn't. Okay? Thank you. But the point of it is we get so caught up in what we can't have, and that's a problem. Young people, let me tell you something tonight, uh, and all of us in general, that the enemy, is all, he's jealous of you coming to church. He's jealous, jealous of you living for God. But he's always going to try to plant something in your way to distract you. And it's usually things that spiritually you know you can't have. And if he can get us to focus on the things that we can't have, then he can ca cause us to be distracted about, about thinking about all the blessings that we do have. He, he doesn't want you to do this because you're going to be like him. Didn't think about, you know what? God created me to live eternally. He gave us the trees to eat of. There's only one tree out here. Only one tree that he said, you can't partake of this. Only one. But the enemy illuminated that thing in her mind. And said, ah, oh, look at this. Look at this. And when he got her to look at it, she became distracted. And said, oh, that's pleasant to the eye. Mm, the fruit looks good. I think I'll try it. Got to realize, in this world we live today, there's a lot of stuff going on. Amen. That's around us. You're going to make decisions that's going to affect your life for eternity. That you need to stop for a moment, put the brakes on, step back, look at it, and say, oh, is this, is this of God or is this not of God? How's this going to affect my walk with God? Folks, it does, you don't have to walk out those double doors and never come back to church ever again to be lost. We can be lost sitting on a church pew. I wish it was as easy as just filling the house up. And if you're here and you're faithful, you're going to make it. Brother Bobby, that's not what the Bible tells us. We have to be faithful to him. Faithful to the things of God. So the enemy is jealous. The devil is jealous. You know, and, and so, so he's going to do anything he can to distract you. Now, let me talk about this. Dan danger of environments. All right, so we have freedom of choice. God gave him freedom of choice. The enemy shows up and paints a different picture. Now I want to talk about the danger of environments. Because we find that the serpent already was at the tree of knowledge of good and evil before Eve ever showed up. Realize this. Eve goes walking that way. And it was a mistake for her to visit the forbidden tree in the first place. You've got to be careful because there's some things out there that if you touch it, you're going to get burnt. 
because there's many hurtful consequences that, that I believe could be avoided by just staying away from certain environments that could lead us into temptation. In fact, the Lord's Prayer, when He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's going to be temptations out there that you and I have to deal with. And we've got to realize that you've got to take a hands-off approach to those things. In fact, can I, can I say to us tonight, we, we don't need to even entertain them. Right? Don't entertain them. Stay away. Turn to your neighbor and say, stay away from those things that would tempt you. Stay away from the environments that are not good for you. Those things that may look good, they may look appealing, but when you look behind it, it's destruction, calamity. It can destroy your life. Freedom of choice. i got to hurry. Freedom of choice. Jealousy of spirit of the serpent. The danger of our environments. And then the fourth thing here is the weapon of the devil. Now, it's simple. The devil caused, or Satan caused, the downfall of the human race. How? Through deception. Now, understand, the Bible says he's cunning. He's smart. He's tactful. He knows how to come in to kind of veil or, in other terms, enlighten your mind about certain things. Deception. Everybody say deception. So what did he do? And this is where we have to be careful. He tried to take the positive word of God that was given to Adam and make it a negative. Folks, that's why your time in the Bible means something because you got to know what the Word of God says. And there's been people before that have spoken word and automatically my mind catches and says, ah, that's not what the Word said. That's not the Word said. Everybody say deception. So the devil will use sometimes even the very Word of God That should be a positive word in your life, and he makes it a negative. In other words, he said in verse 1, Did God say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Okay. Let's take a look at what God really said in in Genesis 2.17. He said, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did God say that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? She should have responded, well, God said that we can eat of every tree in the garden, every other tree of the garden, but we can't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil got to realize the Word of God will lead you and guide you. And at those those critical moments in time when temptation comes your way, if you know the Word, you will understand or automatically tell the devil, you know, come on, get get all behind, get behind me, get out of here, go another, you know, I I know the Word of God. I'm not going to be affected by what you have to say. But Eve allowed that deception to enter into her mind. So you have freedom of choice, jealousy of the serpent, the danger of environments, the weapon of the devil. You need to write this big. Deception. Deception in every form. He'll use many routes, many ways to enter into your life. Now let's look at God's viewpoint number five. Because God was speaking from a positive viewpoint 
And the enemy, in turn, was trying to trick and deceive Eve into believing that God <clears throat> was being unfair. Everybody say unfair. unfair. Now, you hear that a lot today. And probably mostly you probably heard it as parents. When your kids was going up and you said X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. That's not fair. <laughs> Bubby gets to do that, but I don't. That's part of who we are. That's part of our DNA. We want to question things. And we want to say, we feel justified when we say, well, that's not fair. You hear it in the world all over the place today. That's not fair. That's not fair. But God was trying to speak a positive point, and the enemy was just trying to get in her head and say, well, that's not. He's going to let you eat of all the trees of the Garden of Eden, but this one tree, well, that's not fair. Think about it. But here, let me say it this way. Eve's lack of knowledge for what God really said is what affected her when she came face to face with temptation. Lack of knowledge when she came face to face with temptation. Where we got sometimes we got to stop and go back and say, okay, God, what did you say? God, give me your viewpoint. God, cover me with that, your positive viewpoint, your positive word. Now, Adam, he made a mistake. He neglected his responsibility to tell Eve the ways of God. Because the reason I believe Satan was able to deceive Eve was because he knew that she really didn't know exactly what God had in mind. Think about that. Amen. So, I think you and I need to learn sometimes to articulate to our families, and our, our, our husbands and wives, about what God really wants from us. Right? Amen. Adam's mistake. The, the, the mistake was, I believe, not having a thorough conversation about what God's intentions were. Okay? Now, let me hurry up. Seven. The importance of right choices. Everybody say right choices. The key to success, I believe, in life is based upon our ability to make right choices. How many know somebody that's made wrong choices? And they're paying the price for it. And we've made wrong choices sometime down the road and paid the price for it. But the key to success is the ability to make right choices. So it's important for you and I to understand that God has given us the freedom to make those choices. I come to church because I want to. I serve God because I want to. I worship Him because I want to. Right? I want to. I don't have to. My dad was big on that. My dad said, you don't have to, you get to. It's not a burden, it's a blessing. Right? And we can come up with all kinds of excuses of why not. And when that happens, we just got to put them out and say, well, why? Instead of saying, well, why not? It's like, well, because I, I love him. Sometimes you need to sit down with your legal pad of paper and maybe put why not and why I do. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. So make choices. He gave us that. And we didn't have, we don't have to serve God. We don't have to obey the word of God. We don't have to do the right thing. But we always have to remember that every choice that we make has a consequence. Has a 
has a consequence. So if I choose not to serve God, there's a consequence to that. I'm going to be lost. If I choose to walk away from God, there's a consequence with that. I walk out from underneath the protection. I look at it as I walk out from underneath the blood, the covering, the very thing that covers a multitude of sin. We've got to stay focused on it, folks. We've got to stay focused on it. Everybody say focused. Praise God. Do you mind if I just kind of hurry and finish this part? So what is the consequence? Let's go back to Genesis, the third chapter. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, ye are cursed. Everybody say cursed. You are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and ye shall eat dust all the days of your life. You can read Jeremiah 12, 4 and also Romans 8, 20. And they indicate that the whole animal kingdom was affected by the fall. And the Edenic curse. So can I say it this way? We have to be careful lest our fall affects Everything around us. Verse 15, he says, and I will put enmity. That word enmity there is related <clears throat> to the word enemy. In other words, Satan is an enemy of the human race. He's not your friend. That's why I don't understand people that dress up in devil's costumes. That's why I don't understand people that just play along with the Ouija boards and, and, and they'll wear their little horns and, and, and all that kind of stuff. They have no clue who this creature really is. He's not their friend and he's not our friend. He is a destroyer. He is a deceiver. And he doesn't want you to have eternal life in heaven. He wants you to live with him in hell for the rest of eternity. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall, bru he, you shall bruise his heel. <clears throat> to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow, your birth pains. And your, your conception. In pain you will bring forth children. Now medical science kind of helps you with that nowadays. Your desire shall be for your husband. And he shall rule over thee. And Sister Mary says, uh oh. <laughs> now think about it. That wasn't in when they were in the Garden of Eden. Or, 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 you know, before this. Not, not till now. Not till now. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then Adam said, because you have heeded the voice. He said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. King James Version says, because you've obeyed the voice of Eve and not God. And you have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Ye shall not eat of it. Cursed, he said, is the ground for your sake. And in toil, or King James says in sorrow, <clears throat> in toil you shall eat of it. In other words, sorrow is the same word applied to Eve in verse 16. Thus, what he's saying here is, you both are going to share equally in your punishment. See, the punishment was placed upon the man and the woman as well as the effect of sin upon everything in the Garden of Eden. On nature itself. And folks, it means to remind us of the terrible consequences 
of sin. And the reason why the world is in a mess, the mess that it is today, is because Adam and Eve made the choice <coughs> to rebel against the Word of God and the commandments of God. And folks, look at it. The world has been filled with rebellion ever since. And folks, in our beloved United States of America, you are seeing more and more people openly rebelling against the things of God. Fasten your seatbelt because it's going to get worse. They're trying to work their way to where they're going to have more and more rule over the churches. And you're going to have to watch what you say because already people are feeling the punishment of losing jobs. Why? Because they believe in the biblical institution of marriage between a man and a woman. That can cost you your job in some places. I've listened to them on the radio. Wasn't too far long ago. We didn't, we didn't worry about that. We were a great Christian nation, and we were, you know, we were just all, you know, this is the foundation of who we are. That's quickly going by the wayside. So let me say it, we need to pray, we need to, we need to fast, we need to seek the face of God <clears throat> because the world is rebelling against the things of God. <clears throat> so sin in the beginning, you know, may seem a little harmless and enticing. However, we always remember that sin, you know, that you've heard this expression before, but let me say it, sin will take you further than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than what you intended to stay. Romans 6, 23, what does it say? The first part of that scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. <coughs> wages, everybody say wages. Wages emphasize what we deserve. You earned them. If we go to hell, we earned it. We earn the consequences. James 1, 15 says this. Then when lust, translation, desire, hath conceived, it brings forth or gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Sin, when it is finished, sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you. <clears throat> Here's the important part. That he will not hear. Do you know why repentance is so important for us? Because when we aren't doing right, there is a barrier between you and God and it's your repentance that breaks that burial down that brings God God's attention back your way that's why so many Christians today struggle <clears throat> because they pray prayers sometimes but they know that everything's not right in their lives that's why we need to pray and say, God, help me, help me. Let me say it again. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. In other words, your iniquities have put a wall between you and God. Has created a separation between you and God. And it's your sins that hid his face from you that he will not hear you. So I close with this. We've got to understand how dangerous sin really is and what it does to not only our lives but also our families. 
And let me say it again. The reason why our world is in so much trouble is because of sin. And the Bible lets us know that God absolutely hates sin. Absolutely. But we have good news. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Because those, for those whose lives have been affected by sin, we have good news. And what is that good news? There is hope in Jesus. We're going to talk about it next week, the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you right. We have hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. For at the very beginning, he set aside. He said, okay, I know there's a problem now. So we got to, we got to come up with a remedy. He said, you know what? The day will come. I'll robe myself in flesh. I'll come and dwell among them. I will give up my life, my body as a sacrifice. My blood will be shed. Amen. Stripes will be up on my back. Amen. I'm going to go through all this torment, and I'm going to carry those sins to the cross. And folks, you and I, that's what we have tonight. We have, amen, hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why on Christ the solid rock I can stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let me tell you something right now, folks. Hear me when I tell you this. This is not the day to walk away from God. This is not the day to say, you know what, I'm fed up, I'm tired, you know, I'm, you know, you guys go to church way too much, you know, I'm just, I just, you know, I feel like, you know, I can, I can kind of make it on my own. No, this is not the day and time to do that. This is the day and time where we kind of make a determination that, that above all else, I've got to be saved. I'm going to see the enemy for who he is, and I'm going to pray God open my eyes that I might see his deceptions. And give me the strength that I can withstand and stand on your word and stand on your, your true, sure foundation. You believe that tonight? Why don't we stand together as we close, raise our hands, and let's just pray, God help us, amen, in our everyday life. Can you do that? Just lift your voices and lift your hands. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity again, amen, to be in your house of worship. Thank you for your presence that's here. Thank you for your word, because truly it is uh, an illuminating force in our lives. I thank you, Lord God, that you are here for us and you have given us the opportunity, amen, of a lifetime and an eternity that we can, we can give you our all, amen, we can submit ourselves to you and let you correct our lives, change our lives, give us something to live for. Thank you, Lord, as we go into this Easter season. Thank you, Lord Jesus, amen, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for going to the cross for us. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Because without it, Lord, we would not have any hope. So, God, we thank you, Lord. Touch our brothers and sisters today. Lead and guide them. Go with them. Protect them. Touch our bodies, those that are sick in body. We pray again for Sister Niece tonight, Lord Jesus, that you would touch her body. God, take these symptoms away, the chilling and the cold and the hot and the tremble, Lord God. I pray, God, that you would give her that peace in her life, peace in her mind, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody say in Jesus' name.